thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have you. And I'm going to let our first set of speakers share their slides. Welcome Shannon Tennant and Patrick Rudd. Uh, absent their co-author and co-presenter Chrissy Stein, or maybe Steen, for uh, finding and using data, the for a first year writing approach. Take it away. Good morning. We're glad you joined our presentation uh, and we look forward to your um, questions. I'm Patrick Rudd, coordinator of library instruction and outreach. And I'm Shannon Tennant. I am the coordinator of library collections. And our third presenter, unfortunately, could not be with us today. Um, she is Professor uh, Chrissy Stein, and she is actually teaching a first year writing class in Denmark right now. And we were hoping that she would be able to zoom in, but uh, their schedule changed, and so she is not able to make it today. Librarians at Elon have a long history of partnership between first year writing faculty and librarians. We work with about 90% of the first year writing sections called English 1100, usually two librarians co-teaching with the instructor. We design the class focusing on basic information literacy concepts and closely aligning them with the assignment prompt. We have worked with Professor Stein for many years in this format, but last year she developed a new assignment in line with new curricular and university goals. This assignment aligns with the English 1100 shared learning outcomes, particularly under the heading, Conducting Research to Inquire. You can see why library and partnership is critical here, but the emphasis in this new assignment is finding and using data. Elon began a new strategic plan in 2020 called Boldly Elon. And you see in the language of the first theme, the concepts of data competency and media literacy. And those were the focuses as Professor Stein designed the assignment. Also, Elon is starting a new QEP, Quality Enhancement Program, as part of our regional accreditation. And Elon selected data competency as our theme. With this new assignment, we had the opportunity to scaffold our library instruction in three sessions instead of the usual one shot. The first session at the beginning of the semester provided an information literacy foundation focused on finding sources, understanding the difference between popular and scholarly sources and evaluating sources. You'll notice in the Google Doc that students already had a chosen topic and the goal of the session was to locate and evaluate two sources about that topic. Librarians and Professor Stein engaged with students throughout the class, and their product from this session was to create an annotated bibliography. So the class is returned to the library about six weeks later for a library session specifically focused on finding and understanding quantitative research. At this point, the relationship with the librarians was already established because firstly, they had come um, for a library session already. And then secondly, a number of students had scheduled research consultation appointments with us um, in the interim. Instead of the usual two librarians that we would have at a session of this type, we had four uh, of our colleagues in the session. We felt some of us did not quite feel um, that we were necessarily experts or, or uh, totally comfortable with finding data. So we wanted a little bit of help. And also by having more librarians, we were able to bring in different disciplinary expertises. So two of the librarians that came, one was the business liaison and one was the communications liaison. So in this session, first we defined with the students, what is data, what is quantitative research. Then using our data and statistics research guide, we showed them some of our favorite statistics sites like Statista and Pew, and also ways to search for organizations um, out on the internet. Then we had the students fill out another Google Doc. So the second and third library sessions were uh, building to a culminating final project. And for this final project, the students were assigned to choose an issue that was important to them 
and to persuade an audience about the issue. But instead of writing a traditional paper or an op-ed, which English 1100 will often do, this time the students were to create an infographic, and so they needed data. The student topics were incredibly wide ranging. I don't know if you can read this tiny little snapshot of our Google Doc, but some examples were the effects of abusive relationships. Is e-cigarette use worse than regular cigarettes? Body image pressures on dancers. Firefighters having to respond to more medical calls rather than fires. We also asked, um, if you look, compare this Google Doc to the previous one, for an increased sophistication in their evaluation of the sources. We didn't want them to just find a chart, find a graph, but we asked them, what is the reliability um, of this data? Who created it? Who organized it? Who, who put it together? But also the relevance. Yeah, not just any statistic vaguely about your topic. Most of the students used the statistics databases, um, but they were also searching websites of different organizations that were involved with their issues. Only two weeks later, the students returned for their third library session. And this time the focus was on qualitative research. We went back to two librarians in the session because we felt like both the students and the librarians had built their expertise um, with this uh, searching. So, when the students returned, they had the same topics, but in the intervening two weeks, they had been meeting with their professor, and now the topics were even narrower and more nuanced. This time, as the students found sources, we asked them to focus on the audience of the infographic. Who will be persuaded by your, your, your graphic, and what data will convince that particular person or group? The audiences that the students wanted to persuade were just as varied as their topics, and very personal. So the dance topic wanted to persuade a dance studio owner who favored some dances, dancers over others, presumably based on their appearance. The e-cigarette topic was to persuade an older family friend um, to perhaps not use e-cigarettes. One student wanted to persuade her brother that he should end an abusive relationship. So as I say, these were very personal topics um, and their audiences in the second column there are very, uh, the professor asked them to, to be very, very specific about who are they, what is, what is their background. And in the rest of the Google Doc, as they found sources, we asked students to start considering how to weave the data into an argument. Don't just throw in a number, but how does it connect to and support your argument? The students went back into the scholarly sources, but again, organization websites, to try to get stories and interviews. For example, in the G column here in the second row, um, the student says that their research is an actual questionnaire. <laughs> and the students had a much better idea at this point of what information they needed because they had spent so much time with both the data and their research question. You can see in column uh, K, the first box, the student says, this is the most, this source is the most important of all. And in the I box, all in caps, it says, this source is perfect. <laughs> we like to see that. <laughs> But because they had worked with so many sources over the course of the, of the time, they actually were able to say, okay, this one is what I need. Here is an example of a student's final product, their infographic. You can see the data visualization as well as that little box on the right where they cited their sources. We'll give you a minute to look. Professor Stein felt that this was a particularly strong example of student work, well representing the relationship between accurately representing data and connecting it to research sources. Not all students, of course, completely mastered the concepts. In this example, the student used a confusing graphic that misrepresented the data. The poverty rate is higher for Black Americans, but the big money bag makes it look like they have more money, not less.
So some of our key takeaways from this experience. The scaffolded library sessions really allowed students to build their research skills and their data skills across the whole semester. And we felt that it was really aligned with the ACRL literacy frame, scholarship as conversation. Students learned how to put their data sources in conversation with each other and also with their arguments. The students were able to explore and consider multiple points of view and perspectives. And we already mentioned that the students had the opportunity to deepen relationships with librarians from different disciplines. Professor Stein administered a questionnaire to her students about how they expanded their knowledge during the research process. You can see uh, some of the major themes here are that the students found the library sessions helpful. Always good to hear that. That students were discovering that the library had a lot of good resources. And also that they learned how to find and evaluate sources. One comment that Professor Stein made that her students uh, had said to her was some students said that it was easier for them to work with data because they didn't have to read a whole article. They could go to Statista and get a chart. These students uh, were stronger in a different kind of literacy uh, rather than sort of the traditional reading scholarly articles. But Professor Stein did observe that generally the weaker students were the ones who said that it was easier to do the infographic rather than a paper. Her better students, her stronger students, said that they actually did more research for the infographic than they would have for a traditional paper, which we thought was very interesting. And now we're ready for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing, I think. Thank you, Shannon and Patrick. That was great. And several of the comments are, are to the effect of great, great presentation. Thank you for the specific examples and for explaining the, the good and the bad and letting us sort of look at how things happened. That's wonderful. So I'm going to pass a few questions on to you. First, um, we have a couple about what tool or tools were used to create the infographics. They used Canva, didn't they? Okay, so it was all in Canva. Fantastic. Uh, there was uh, some guesses for that it was probably Canva and- uh, Had that look. That <laughs> it, it does have that look, but also they did a really, really good job of it. Um, was there a training specifically on how to design data visualizations and communicate visually? Do you know? Yes, uh, for, um, Professor Stein spends um, several class sessions really working with them about how to do that effectively. And she has expanded that um, part of the class um, as she has taught this. So um, she, she recognizes the need for that. And she's brought in some other um, um, experts from campus to sort of help students with that. Excellent. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... Did the students have to write captions, alt text, or a summary of the story in any format that was that was being visualized? Do you remember? I don't know if, in addition to the graphic, if they did they present the graphics. So I, they they presented it, and and I would think that was where their explanation came in. I'm not sure about a, a written explanation. I would imagine they would, but I, I can't say for sure. That makes sense. Um, and to, on points in your last slides, would you what would you change next time to encourage students uh, to do more research into the story, especially those who thought it was easier to work with the data? Gosh. If anything. I think we really, you always hope that you're going to be able to reach every student. And that, again, was one of the advantages of having so many librarians, because there's, what, about 20 students in the class. And the more people you have to go around and work with each student individually, um, the easier it is. You know, even with, even with two of us, that's a lot of students to get around to in the course of a, an hour and something class period. So actually, I, I do think having more um, more of us there to 
actually make sure that we talk to every student, not just the ones who raise their hands, but all of the students. <laughs> um, and I think part of so with the QEP, um, faculty, staff and students will be engaging with data in deeper and richer ways. So we are going to um, hone our expertise within that that work. So I think spending um, more time with us actually unpacking, discovering the data, interpreting it, how you connect it to sources and conversation um, will be a larger part as we get more adept in in working with data and using it as, as research sources. Yeah, I was going to say that's one of the things on the slides is modeling teachers as learners, because we are not experts in data ourselves. Uh, we are also going to grow <laughs> our knowledge over the course of the QEP. <laughs> so this is how we're trying to learn. <laughs> sure. A data communication is its own like sub thing, too, as well as data discovery. Um, also, anyone in the audience who has questions, if I missed it and you put it in the chat, please do re-put it into the q and I, I might have lost it in the in the uh, broader discussion movement in the chat. Um, and so this might this question might tie into your previous answer, but what have you found the biggest challenge for you being librarians trying to support this assignment? Yeah, it's the learning. <laughs> <laughs> and and hence pulling in our colleagues like our business librarian and, and others that have done more of this work. So it, really critical to get their expertise and learn from them. And so in front of the classes, you know, we would be having a conversation with the students, but also among uh, librarians about how to locate data and where they should be searching. I, I think that that's important for them to see, um, you know, our processing work that we do. And sometimes students don't always see that. So I, I think that's another effective part. But we really learn from one another librarians that are engaging with this at, at deeper levels, certainly than than I have been. And and of course, like everyone, we wish we had more money and more databases and more resources. But actually, we still could be spending some time mastering the ones we have. So uh, that would certainly help too. And you saw that wide range of topics. This this was not the sort of data where it's just, oh, we need, you know, uh, climate change data yeah. or we need water temperature. <laughs> we were really looking sometimes for these, uh, these concepts. Huh, right. And on that note, I just realized that I missed an earlier q and I apologize. Um, is there any chance that you would share a template version of the spreadsheet you used for the class planning? Um, yeah, happy to. If you can send us a, a, a blankified spreadsheet for that, we would be delighted to put it on the OSF with your with your slides, if that's okay. Let me sure. make a note. <laughs> that would be lovely. That. that was a really good tracking <laughs> spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you. And whoever suggested that, thank you for suggesting that. Um, I'm going to intersperse my own uh, data wonk question for a moment and ask, was there any discussion about how to cite data and data sets? I noticed that you just yeah. that they just named it, which yeah. is fine. And, and also, I'm sure partially, which is better than nothing. Yeah. And it's and right. And they're thinking about like, where did this come from? <laughs> so that's good. Is there any thought around those practices? That that would definitely be the next step. I and certainly when we're teaching data in, in other classes, we talk about how to how to cite your statista chart, how to how to do that. Um, with the infographic, it's going to be a little challenging because you don't really have room for like a full MLA bibliography on there without distracting from it. Um, but yes, I mean, certainly citation, giving credit to your sources is one of our our pushes when students come and it and it came up in the classes and certainly it was a new um you know usually we're citing articles or video content um and so it, it was uh new questions being asked about citing charts and that kind of thing so um we did we did address that and and students um you know get it at different levels um as you're trying to work through that oh i see mandy in the chat suggested footnotes I don't know. <laughs> Occasionally we have professors who have their students use Chicago and footnotes. And that's that, that's a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> and I apologize, but maybe you could in the chat as uh, as we uh, demote you. <laughs> when you come back, maybe you could answer the, is there anything you would do differently next time? 